tonight from Washington, D.C., one year till a presidential election, one step towards impeachment, one common figure. People don't want anything to do with impeachment. We'll hear from the heart of Trump country. Plus, our candid chat with one of the most senior members of Barack Obama's administration. Yes, this is a difficult time. Is it the most difficult? No way. Susan Rice on a divided America and the Canadian memory that brings her to tears. I could not believe my eyes. Also tonight, our Go Public team investigates a senior's home and one family's anguish. And the political challenge of a frustrated West, what the Liberals are doing about it. This is The National. We are in Washington, D.C. tonight, just outside the U.S. Capitol building. This town is buzzing with political tension and some partisan division because an enormous Democratic decision is now looming. In exactly one year, U.S. voters will elect a president. And while saying an election is historic is a little like saying the sun is bright, 2020 already promises to break the mold. Donald Trump will possibly be the first U.S. president to run for re-election with impeachment on his resume. Tonight, we will look at his political vulnerability and his enduring popularity, and we will get a well-known Washington veteran's take. Because the way both Democrats and Republicans are talking, well, the next 12 months won't just be about history. They will be about the future of the U.S. democracy. In the coming weeks, a lot of the drama will unfold right here behind me. The impeachment inquiry is entering a new and public phase. And Susan Ormiston shows us a White House racing to distract, discredit, and deny. Donald Trump's strategy today to fight impeachment? Damn the Democrats, the media, and the polls. Everyone else's. I have the real polls. The CNN polls are fake. The Fox polls have always been lousy. I tell them they ought to get themselves a new pollster. But the real polls, if you, you look at the polls, that, you look at the polls that came out this morning, people don't want anything to do with impeachment. It's a phony scam. It's a hoax. The president is clearly vexed he can't change the channel. So he's jabbing at the whistleblower as a partisan liar. But the whistleblower should be revealed because the whistleblower gave false stories. Some people would call it a fraud. I won't go that far. Or maybe he would, he added. The whistleblower's legal team says Republicans can ask him written questions, but not unmask him. As for the inquiry, the Washington Post reported this weekend that some Senate Republicans would now admit that Trump did withhold military aid to Ukraine in return for investigating the Bidens but they'd say that was not impeachable. Trump advisor Kellyanne Conway floated that strategy this morning. Kellyanne, you, you very notably won't say yes or no. It doesn't... Quid pro quo, yes or I no. I just said to you, I don't know whether aid was being held up and for how long... Donald Trump continues to deny. What do I quid pro quo? No, not at all. One year out from the 2020 election, what the president heard last night at a mixed martial arts event in Madison Square Garden mimics the latest poll on impeachment, boos and cheers in almost equal measures. So nearly an even split uh, on impeachment uh, at the moment. What else do we know about American voters one year out? Incredibly polarized, more than perhaps since the 1960s, and so much uncharted territory between now and then, Adrian. I mean, will voters fe face an impeached president? Who will the Democrats choose, a liberal or a moderate candidate? And then the economy, will it stay strong? Or if it slips, that could hurt the president. So we come from a country where elections are sort of 40 days long. To think about it as a year out, it's, it's so far away. Uh, are they engaged now? American Incredibly. Uh, poll shows between 75 and 80 percent of Democrats and Republicans are already keenly interested in the election. The challenge really for the parties is can they whip up enough energy to get them out to vote? Because as you well know, and they've told me, a lot of people are fed up with the rancor and the mean spiritedness of the current politics. All right, Susan, thanks very much. We'll see you tomorrow. Sure. So, much more to come from Capitol Hill. You will meet diehard Donald Trump supporters. Paul Hunter takes us inside a Trump campaign-style rally. Plus, 
the national interview with Susan Rice. The former national security advisor tells us why she has finally come around to the impeachment inquiry. Now to news at home. Grief is hanging thick over Winnipeg tonight. A dark fog that won't lift anytime soon, especially for the family of three-year-old Hunter Strait Smith. The little boy was stabbed in his bed last week and died yesterday in hospital after being taken off life support. This evening, the family held a vigil to honor his short life and Aaron Broman was there. The whole community was invited to gather here tonight outside the home where Hunter lived with his mother. The family is trying to find comfort after unimaginable tragedy. Daryl Contwa has been speaking for them. It's very emotional because a lot, of, a lot of people care. A lot of people are out here to support the family when they need it. All day long, people brought flowers, treats and toys to a memorial for Hunter outside the house. When I heard it, it just hits home. Like a three-year-old, like the, it just hits right in the heart. When Hunter died in hospital Saturday night, his family was at his side, his mother holding his hand. 33-year-old Daniel Jensen had already been charged with attempted murder. Police say he was out with the boy's mother, his former partner, early Wednesday. It's alleged he assaulted her, then went to the house and attacked the boy, who was in the care of an adult family member. Constable Rob Carver says the charges will be upgraded soon. He's currently in custody and detained. He's not going anywhere, so... We want to make sure we do this right. There have been nearly 40 homicides in Winnipeg this year, a dramatic increase over last year. This outreach worker says it's taking a toll. This last bit of violence uh, culminating in, in, in Hunter's death has been like uh, over the top and it, it makes me feel a little, you know, a, a lot discouraged. But he says coming together like this is necessary. We need to keep mobilizing, we need to keep meeting and, and having ceremony and, and uh, uh, creating spaces for people to heal. The death of a child making it especially hard. And it should be hard. I mean, we, as law enforcement, need to be professional, but uh, the last thing we want to do is lose our humanity. And I think things like this remind us that we're just people who come to work every day and go home to our uh, families, and, and, and it's hard. Hunter's family was at tonight's vigil. They say they're touched by the outpouring of support. Aaron Broman, CBC News, Winnipeg. Now to a pretty disturbing story from British Columbia. A 94-year-old woman was confined to her room for more than two weeks at Christmas time after bed bugs infested her apartment in a senior care home and staff were allegedly told not to tell her about the outbreak. Erica Johnson has this week's Go Public investigation. A bed bug outbreak, footage nervously taken last December by a nursing home worker inside the room of Rita Bedford, 94 at the time and blind. A resident at the Cascades, owned by one of Canada's biggest nursing home chains, Sienna. Today is a new day. Bed bugs from a neighboring apartment had infested Bedford's room. Documents show management brought in pest control for next door, but not for Bedford's apartment bed bugs multiplied and management confined Bedford to her room for two weeks over Christmas. A worker sent the secret video to Bedford's daughter. I was dumbfounded. I could not believe my eyes. Another employee took pictures, emailed them to provincial health authorities, writing, please help these persons, it's inhumane. She alleged everyone was informed by management to lie. Since Bedford was blind, she couldn't see what was going on. I could not believe that a facility in Canada subsidized by the province would allow something so hideous to happen. BC's Ministry of Health investigated and found the nursing home was not in compliance with several regulations, including protecting residents from abuse and neglect. This lawyer is currently pursuing dozens of lawsuits against all three of Canada's biggest nursing home chains, Siena, Extendicare and Rivera, alleging neglect and abuse. I'm infuriated that we still are allowing these um, corporations to make money off our seniors and still allowing them to make that money while delivering shoddy care. 
the allegations against the big three chains haven't been proven in court. The companies say they don't have merit. As for the bed bug outbreak, Sienna declined an interview request. The nursing home giant did apologize to Rita Bedford and her family, saying their actions should have been better. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. And remember, the Go Public stories come from you. So do you have a tip for Erica and the team to investigate? If you do, send us an email at gopublic at cbc.ca. Last night in Edmonton, more than 700 Albertans brought their grievances into public view at a rally for Western separation, what is being called Wexit. Well, tonight, Olivia Stefanovic looks into that regional alienation and how it might just lead to political action. For an extreme sign of Western frustration, look no further than this upside-down Canadian flag, where hundreds gather to discuss separation. We are going to make Alberta great again, and that is when we cut ourselves off from the leech that is Eastern Canada. But even in this crowd, not everyone wants out of Canada. This country's great, but we do have to get some power back, and that's what the blackmail of separation comes in. Whether it's a bargaining chip or a serious threat, this Alberta MP says the frustration must be acknowledged. It's, uh, it's deeply concerning. And I can tell you that back in 2015, when I uh, first uh, ran for Member of Parliament, I almost never heard anyone talk about uh, Western separation. The Prime Minister's office is scheduling one-on-one -on -one meetings between Justin Trudeau and other party leaders, including Conservative leader Andrew Scheer. But those are at least a week away, and Trudeau has tapped Anne McClellan, an Albertan and former Liberal cabinet minister, to advise him on Western issues. It's not about having uh, a Liberal from Alberta on an advisory team, no, it's about issues, and it's about, in particular, energy issues. After the election, Trudeau promised to listen to the Westerners who shut out his party. Uh, to talk about how we can make sure that the concerns, the very real concerns of Albertans, are being addressed and reflected uh, by, uh, by this government. The Liberal government needs to uh, refocus and reposition uh, in terms of uh, their policies, uh, particularly on the energy file. Western MPs say the time for talk is over. They want to see pipelines built to move more oil to market. The government says that's what it's working on. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. So as some Westerners seek a new deal from the federal government, Green Party leader Elizabeth May faces some questions about her future. Jayla Bernstein looks at rumblings for change from within the ranks. After leading federal Greens for more than a decade, Elizabeth May's name is practically synonymous with her party. But her time may be up. She's exhausted, actually, from doing the job. She's 65 years old. The Green Party needs a general generational change. Clearly, she's taken it as far as she can take it. The thing for the Green Party has always been, are, are they just a vehicle for Elizabeth May or, or are they something much bigger than that? I considered it... May recently told CBC she's toying with the idea of running for Speaker of the House, but she also suggested she might stay in her role a bit longer in case there's a snap election. Some party members are getting impatient. I think it's time because um, we're faced with a rising youth-led climate movement. People are asking for somewhat more radical solutions to the climate crisis. People want to see young people in positions of leadership. The leader of Quebec's Green Party was one of the people behind a recent petition calling for a leadership race. Alex Tyrrell says he would consider throwing his hat in the ring. The par Green Party has been based in BC for a long time. That's where our first successes came from. But I think that it would be beneficial for the Green Party to go beyond British Columbia and really move into the position of a national party across Canada. Whatever May decides for her future, she seems to have earned respect from colleagues across the country. She has done a remarkable job as leader of the Green Party to plow the ground for Greens to be elected in Canada. The party's federal council and its caucus of three met this weekend in Ottawa. No word so far on whether any leadership decisions were made. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. Now to some of the other stories we're watching this Sunday night. Uh, we've made significant progress in the last 48 hours. Hydro-Quebec says 110,000 customers are still without power following Friday's storm, but it says it expects to have everyone reconnected by Tuesday. Workers from Ontario, New Brunswick, even Detroit, 
are helping Hydro-Quebec with those repairs. And Toronto police are looking for a man who allegedly grabbed an eight-year-old girl after school on Friday. They say he dragged her to his SUV, but she was able to break free and then run away. A doorbell camera captured the suspect's vehicle driving away. There has to be more safety precautions for the kids, and uh, that's why for myself we put up cameras as well. Toronto schools will be reviewing safety tips with kids tomorrow. The global head of McDonald's has been forced out. The board says the president and CEO, Steve Easterbrook, violated company policy by having a consensual relationship with an employee. Easterbrook apologized in a company-wide email. The president of McDonald's USA is taking his place. And in Brazil, clashes between those trying to exploit the Amazon and those trying to protect it turned deadly Friday night. An indigenous warrior was shot in the head, ambushed, his tribe says, by illegal loggers. The rainforest has been at the center of a tug of war for months, the environment versus the economy, protecting what some call the lungs of the earth or using that land for farming, logging and mining. That approach is blamed for so many of the summer's wildfires. As Shannon Martin tells us, that is what pushed that warrior into action and may have cost him his life. I'm scared sometimes, he says, but we are fighting. Six weeks later, Paolo Paulino Guajajara is now dead, killed by the people his tribe fights against, illegal loggers. His group, the Guardians of the Forest, say the only way to protect their land is to do it themselves. He was, you know, a young father of one child, married, uh, and very much a person who lived in the forest, who saw the forest as the future for himself and his family. This researcher, who spent decades in Brazil, says the Guajajara has long been under threat. Violence, she says, is getting worse. This video shows the Guardians in their fight, carrying weapons and torching equipment owned by their enemy, loggers who constantly target their territory, which is supposed to be protected by the Brazilian government. The country's justice minister pledged today to find those responsible for the killing. Do you have faith that that, that will happen given the conflicts that's been going on? I have to say I, I'm not optimistic. There have been very few cases where Indigenous peoples have been targeted and murdered where the perpetrators have been brought to justice. Before becoming Brazil's president, Jair Bolsonaro promised to revoke the protected status of an Indigenous reserve. And when fires burned in the Amazon this summer, he was accused of favoring business over everything else. Advocates are saying the Bolsonaro government has indigenous blood on its hands, adding the increase in violence is a direct result of his hateful speeches. We are protecting our land, he says, and the life on it, something this young warrior did until the end. Shannon Martin, CBC News, Toronto. We have a lot more ahead tonight from Capitol Hill. Just one near year now until America votes. And with that in mind, we sit down with former U.S. National Security Advisor Susan Rice. Her thoughts on impeachment, the election, and Donald Trump. And later, Paul Hunter takes us inside Trump's campaign-style rallies. You will hear from loyal supporters, now more important than ever, for his re-election. We are back at the Washington Capitol, unusually busy this weekend with a parade celebrating the Washington Nationals World Series win and election now one year away and congressional offices plotting the next moves in the impeachment drama. As you've already seen, impeachment clearly consumes Donald Trump's attention. Part of his message now focused on the whistleblower who started it all. He's a Susan Rice guy. He's an Obama guy. And he hates Trump. To be clear, that whistleblower is still anonymous. But in raising suspicions about his or her motives, it is telling that Trump mentioned Susan Rice. The former national security advisor spent more time in that role than all of Trump's NSAs combined. So no surprise in this town, her name resonates. 
Ambassador Susan Rice is a Washington heavyweight. She spent years working with President Barack Obama, becoming a vital voice in his administration. Protest uh, began outside of our consulate in Benghazi. First as the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, later as his national security advisor. Throughout it all, she's been tough and direct. Happens to have a lot to say about Washington now in her own full-throated way. Because Lindsey Graham isn't just a piece of now. He's Lindsay, been a piece of yeah. Lindsey Graham. I said it. <laughs> she is back in the public eye. We sure as hell need to agree that a hostile foreign power has no business messing with our elections. Her new memoir is called Tough Love and chronicles her time on the front lines of American politics and what a battlefield that is. I met up with Ambassador Rice this weekend in Washington. Ambassador Rice, thank you very, very much. Really, really appreciate this. Congratulations on the Nationals, I think. Thank you. I gather this thank is very you. important to you. It, well, of course. <laughs> Washington native, we have to celebrate these things. It is a precisely a year until the Americans go to the polls again. How do you feel now about where the country is at, one year out? Well, I, you know, I, I think that Democrats are likely to win. I think that the American people uh, have seen a lot of Donald Trump now and much of the downside uh, of his leadership, which is, you know, rife with dishonesty, rife with self-interest, domestically and in terms of foreign policy. And, you know, it's very hard to predict where the impeachment inquiry will end up. And I, uh, whether or not that leads to removal, which I think is unlikely, uh, I think it will um, deepen concerns among the American public. How do you feel about this whole process happening a year out? Look, I think I, like a lot of uh, Democratic uh, voters and Democratic members of Congress, <clears throat> came to the judgment belatedly an impeachment inquiry was necessary. When the Ukraine uh, transcript came to light and the absolute clarity that it seems to uh, demonstrate about the president's interests in, you know, extorting uh, dirt on a political rival, false dirt on a political rival for his own personal gain and to hold up congressionally approved military assistance to a country that needs it desperately because of Russian aggression. It's so outrageous. It's such an abuse of power. There is a real divide in this country. And I think I was a bit taken aback because I, I, I know that it's very personal for people, the divisions. But I didn't know that you're experiencing the divisions within your own family. Your own son, Jake, is completely politically opposite from you. And not completely, but he's a, he's a staunch conservative. And as I write in the book, there are areas where we agree. Mm -hmm. uh, there are areas, more areas where we disagree, uh, particularly on domestic policy. Um, but he's my son, and I'm very proud of him. I love him to death, just as I love my daughter, who's a bit younger and quite a bit to the left. So <laughs> we've got a bit of both in our household. Uh, and my husband, Ian, and I are somewhat in the middle, trying to uh, keep the food from flying at the dinner table. Does it make you look at this country a little differently, though, with a, a bit does. more empathy for, for the divides? I actually feel quite fortunate uh, that I have the, an insight into how a substantial portion of people in this country are thinking. And I, you know, I try to understand it and to, to be respectful of those differences. And so one of the gifts that um, our son Jake has given us is um, a broader perspective and a, a sense of urgency about the importance of trying to find common ground. Do you think Americans are, at, at this moment are, are able to reconcile those differences? I think we are? have to. I refuse to bet against uh, America's ability to, to grow and renew itself um, and to heal. And so, yes, this is a difficult time. Is it the most difficult? No way. Uh, can we do it? Yes. But the, the nature of the challenges are somewhat different given this new political and media environment. You know, if we don't confront these divisions with a sense of urgency and uh, necessity, that they could be uh, what undermines our, not only our global leadership, but our democracy. As you know, Canada's relationship with China right now is really raw and not very good and, and stemming largely from that arrest of Meng Wanzhou, the CEO. Should Canada have been asked to arrest her by the Americans? 
I think yes. There was, I assume, significant uh, evidence to suggest that she had um, committed a crime. W what worries me, though, is then the way President Trump suggested, having asked for the arrest, mm -hmm. that, you know, we might trade her at your expense you know, in the context of, you know, some trade negotiation, if it were beneficial in his estimation uh, to get what we want in a trade deal. That's not right. Knowing the Chinese leadership the way you do and the way it works, how does Canada get out of this? You know, I don't think Canada benefits from caving. And I realize that, you know, there are citizens that, who are in detention and that it's a very uncomfortable and, and, and unpleasant place to be. But in my experience, China will, if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile when it comes to things of this sort. What is the security risk to Canada if it does business with, with Huawei while the United States does not? It's, it's hard for me to emphasize adequately without getting into classified terrain how sig serious it is particularly for countries that are part of the Five Eyes mm -hmm. intelligence sharing uh, network with the United States, so UK, Canada, Aust Australia, New Zealand, the US, um, for those countries in particular to be reliant on Huawei technology. It gives the Chinese the ability, if they choose to use it, uh, to access all kinds of information, civilian intelligence, military, that could be very, very compromising. So I, much as I disagree with the Trump administration on a number of things, on this, their concern about Huawei, I believe they're right. And I believe they've handled it badly. There's all kinds of ways that they're um, doing things around this issue which are unhelpful. But on the very specific concern about Huawei, I think it's frankly quite justified. In terms of the relationship between Canada and the United States and the rest of the Five Eyes, if Canada does business with Huawei in the future, as a matter of protection, would the United States have to have a slightly different yes, security relationship we can, with Canada? Yes, and that will throw the Five Eyes collaboration, which is, serves the security interests of every Canadian and every American, into jeopardy. It, it, we just, it, it can't be done. Can't share. I don't see how we can share in the way we have. It's not a joke. It's truly serious. Your connections to Canada are very strong. Your husband, Ian, is a Canadian. He was a producer at, at this program. And yet I was surprised in reading your book the impact or the meaning of the moment of the death of Barbara Frum uh, for your family. Yeah. Um, Ian was my husband, uh, who was then my fiancé, was one of her senior producers on the journal. And uh, he was quite close to her. And through Ian, I'd gotten to know Barbara. And she was a real champion of our impending marriage and very enthusiastic about it. And it, about three or four months before we were due to get married, I kind of freaked out. And I started to have real anxieties about whether or not um, I was ready to get married and could make that kind of commitment. We had been living together, moved out for a period of time. And one morning, as he's getting ready to fly back from South Africa, um, I wake up to CBC radio, as I always did, uh, and the news comes on that Barbara Frum had died. And I was shaken and really saddened. Um, and it made me realize that this was a relationship I wanted to be in for the rest of my life, that she was right about the, the fact that we were right together. And uh, I had this sort of moment of being, this moment of clarity where I realized that uh, I had to see if he would take me back. And I also had to tell him that Barbara had passed. So I, um, I tried to get him paged in the Johannesburg airport. And I guess they sent the message to come to the one, one of those white courtesy telephones. <laughs> and I said, honey, um, and we hadn't spoken in over a month. I said, you know, 
two things. Uh, one, I hope you'll take me back. I really do want to marry you. And two, I wanted you to know that Barbara had passed. I didn't want you to be surprised by that news. And uh, you said he'd take me back. Um, and then, uh, obviously, we mourned Barbara's passing together. But she really was a catalyst in my thinking about uh, what mattered. She well, did us a, a huge service in a way. She'd be so proud of you now. Thank you. I guess she would probably ask you, what would it take for you to run? For what? <laughs> for, for office. For well, Whichever I mean. Whichever one you want. I, it would take me being in the right place personally. Uh, we have a one kid in college, one kid still in high school in uh, her 11th grade year, who both of whom have suffered through eight years uh, of my service under President Obama. But that's not a no. It's not a no. And you know, what I might run for, I mean, I've thought about the Senate. Uh, I've thought about, frankly, uh, other kinds of offices, higher and lower. Have any of the Democratic hopefuls uh, picked up the phone and called you? Yes. For advice, not for anything no, else. You're not, you're not, are <laughs> we going to see your name on a ticket? No, no, I can't imagine that. But yes. Also not a no. I can't imagine it. I'm not, I've not endorsed anybody yet, um, and, but I've, there are several strong candidates in my judgment that I think would make um, excellent presidents, and um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll end up with one of them. A year from now. A year from now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really, really, really appreciate Thank you, Adrian. Appreciate it. Yeah, you make me cry about I'm sorry. Barbara I'm from. Sorry. I just Jeez. <laughs> We'll be right back with much more from Capitol Hill. Donald Trump will need their vote next November. Paul Hunter goes in depth in the heart of Trump country next. Welcome back to Washington. In exactly one year, the U.S. presidential election will be held. Republicans and Democrats will need to rally their bases and get out the vote. For Donald Trump, the campaigning has never really stopped. And as Paul Hunter found out on a trip to Mississippi, neither has the love of his most ardent supporters. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president of the United States, Donald J. Trump. They are part roadshow, part love-in. But Donald Trump's presidential rallies are all parts Donald Trump. Well, thank you very much, and hello, Tupelo. This is great to be with you tonight. The great and exactly one year from next year's election, Trump rallies are also <laughs> giant momentum-building campaign infomercials eaten up by all who turn out to watch, listen, and cheer. But while we're creating jobs and killing terrorists, the Democrat Party has gone completely insane. It's both what he says and how he says it. And we are kicking their ass, I'll tell you. Trump may be behind in the polls broadly, but say those here do not discount Trump supporters because you know what motivated supporters do? They get out and they vote. And Trump seems to know it. On this night, Tupelo, Mississippi. Hello, Dallas. A couple of weeks ago, Dallas. A week before that, Minneapolis. In rally after rally after bring out the crowds and get them excited rally, dozens of them, He's targeted the voters he'll absolutely need come next November. Campaigning in plain sight all along. We're draining the swamp in Washington. So you guys are going to camp out all night or are you going to stay? Think in about it. Hotel? On the day before that rally, these Trump backers gathered in Tupelo's freezing cold to make sure they get a good spot inside eventually. And they do this a lot. What's your number? 
58, sir. 58, 58 rallies. 58 rallies starting with uh, August 29th of 2015. Mm. Ah, that feels good. Hits okay. the spot. Richard Snowden Very drove to Tupelo here. from Las Vegas to get yet another glimpse of Trump. I've done nothing like this. <laughs> I've witnessed nothing like this. Finally, we have a president that gets it and is there to work for the people. It's not about him, it's about the people. This is the hug of the American people, because that's who our president is. Our president is the man of the people. Go Trump! Others here have come from Ohio, Florida, Wyoming, Texas, and yes, Mississippi. They do it because of Trump's policies and because of Trump himself. What he says he'll do, he does it. He really does it. He's not a career politician. He's not, he can't be bought off. I personally feel that if we don't stand and we don't elect, re-elect Trump, that we're gonna be a socialist country one day and that's not a country I want my grandchildren in. Seven or eight hours later, now it's the night before Trump's rally. It's still very cold and they're still at it. In a makeshift tent, the lineup for Trump has grown. She's gonna dress that like an it's eagle. gonna be our eagle. Oh, These women are from Alabama. Have you ever felt this way about a politician? No, before? never. If you had, if somebody had told me five years ago that I would want to go to a campaign rally, that I would be this excited to go to a campaign rally, I would have told them they were crazy. I didn't pay attention to politics. Didn't want nothing to do with politics. It just just bored me to tears. Just, but this man, President Trump, we love him. I mean, it is an honest, heartfelt, because he loves us. We beg you in Jesus' name, don't vote for the Democrats. Next morning, rally day and the Trump Nation machine, with all its messaging, kicks in. Merch on all things Trump is pretty much everywhere. Uh, small man? Yes, sir. In a watch. And those red ball caps remind everyone Trump's been underestimated before and won. If a protest starts here, you Meanwhile, the lineup to get in is now massive. You drove 12 hours to be here? Yes, sir. Why? Because we love Trump. Those who'd lined up all day now mix with those who'd camped out for multiple days. There they are, front row, still waiting. We do. We're brothers. We're brothers. We slept together all last night. <laughs> Florida's Gene Huber, three days in line, has a prediction. Landslide. Landslide? Yes. I guarantee you it's going to be a blowout all the way. Two years ago, Trump picked Gene out of the crowd and called him on stage. Gene's called himself super fan ever since. Mr. President, we love you, sir. We're going to continue to have your back. We're going to walk side by side with you, and we're never going to stop. And as the line grows ever longer, so too that kind of conviction, especially from those we first met the day before. What do you think the message is that this rally and others like it send to the rest of the country regards to the 2020 election? Because we are ready. We're ready to vote. We're ready to stand by our president. So it is. The crowd, now some 10,000, moves in, set to fill every seat, to stand shoulder to shoulder for a president they see as their guy. It's personal. They've waited too long for someone like Trump, they say. And they know that sometimes determination pays off. Indeed, there they are, front row, with their message for 2020, bring it on, they're ready to vote now. And we will make America great again. Thank you, Mississippi. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Tupelo, Mississippi. So the Republicans have their candidate. The Democrats still have a big choice to make. Susan Ormiston will look at that tomorrow. Here's a preview. Democrats were really rocking it on Friday night in Des Moines, Iowa. The unofficial kickoff to the year out to the 2020 election. First, they have to find a candidate they hope will beat Donald Trump. We must beat him. And I will beat him like a drum. I'll break down their critical choice tomorrow night on The National. All right, time for a quick break. When we come back, a Vancouver cemetery is running out of space, and now it's offering shared grave sites. A groundbreaking solution, next.
I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, after mass resignations at the popular sports and culture website Deadspin, we talk about the zombification of news. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Canada's big city cemeteries have a problem. They're filling up, meaning there seems to be a shrinking number of burial spots for the estimated 7 million Canadians who will die in the next 25 years. And that has officials looking for some creative solutions. Karen Paul's now on some groundbreaking ideas in Vancouver. Rena Lazar is preparing for the changing of the seasons. I think I'm going to cut the branches right back. As she prunes her plants, she also contemplates the changing seasons of life and death. I love cemeteries, so I definitely want to be buried. But her cemetery of choice is running out of room. What we're trying to figure out is how to optimize the use of that, that very limited capacity that we have remaining. Mountain View Cemetery is one of the only in Canada allowing families to reuse graves after 40 years, but there's only about five years worth of grave sites left. Historically, one grave would be sold to one person or one family. We now have permission explicitly within our bylaw to split those, that occupancy of that grave. The details are still being worked out, but it means more people can share rights to a site and more people can be buried there over time. Anyone opting in agrees to be buried in a shroud or biodegradable container, and it's only for new graves. No one already buried will be disturbed. We can't tell you exactly which grave we're going to assign you to, but we can at least assign you to a cluster of four or five. These are not mass graves. No, 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 no. These are not mass graves. These are, these are people who are agreeing and want to be buried in a grave that they're sharing space with someone else. These are columbaria. This cemetery Which planner says the lack of around. space is becoming a crisis yeah. across the country. Planners don't talk about cemeteries. Politicians won't talk about it. And most of us don't even want to consider the reality of our own mortality. Some say it's time to reactivate cemeteries like this one that have been closed for decades. This environmental planner says it's an issue of equity. Affordable housing is an issue and this is also an issue within the cemeteries. With her Jewish heritage, Rena Lazar is glad she can be buried at Mountain View Cemetery. I'm super happy to not have to go very far. <laughs> People will still have the option of traditional grave sites like this, but if they want something a little more green, a little less expensive, and they don't mind sharing space with strangers for their final resting place, shared grave sites will soon be an option here. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Vancouver. After the break, we will bring you our moment, which we promise is not a deja vu. Visitors were once again unable to visit this popular Chinese garden in Vancouver, which was closed for a rescue mission. So this popular Chinese garden in Vancouver was closed temporarily this weekend. Why? Well, to rescue their prized koi fish. Six were found dead this week and an otter was spotted in the garden. So if this sounds vaguely familiar, it's also because this happened a year ago. A slippery otter ate 11 koi fish before the rest were removed to safety. Whether this is the same culprit, it has divided loyalties. We're always talking about polarized nations. And this is tonight's moment. I think I'm team koi. <laughs> Otters got to eat. I don't know if there's free food laid out for him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I'm kind of team koi. Well, poor kois. <laughs> no, but, uh, uh, well, you have to protect them. They're very expensive, I heard. Um, so just, I guess we have to remove the, the otter. He was here first. He's got to eat. <laughs> Boy, are not indigenous to this area. <laughs> the otters were here first. This is kind of their home turf, and I kind of feel that disadvantage with, um, you know, the otter coming in to their turf, basically, so I think I'm Team Koi. 
Why are we always fighting? All right, so the deal is that the otters seem to eat six of these koi between Tuesday and Friday when they had to lower uh, the pond. It's, the water is still low. They're not going to raise it until they're sure it's safe, and they're not sure it's safe yet. That is a national for November the 3rd. We will see you again tomorrow night from right here, Washington. Until then, thank you for watching. Good night.